listen, first of all, thank you for the invitation and sincere apologies for not being able to be there in person. Uh, Donna and co have the whole story. I won't bore you with it, but it's a good excuse. <laughs> and I do hope I get to come and, and visit you some other time in the future. I would absolutely love it. I used to live just down the road in Leuven for a year and I lived in Brussels for a year. So I've been very close to where you are for a, a part of my life and I really enjoy that part of the world. So hopefully in the future. But for now, I'm here from Manchester. Um, and yeah, honestly, I think the timing couldn't be better. You know, it's really, I thought that, I thank you for sharing your story too, about coming back from maternity leave. And I think you're not alone, whether or not you'd just come back from leave. I think a lot of people were in the same position last December, January, coming back to, back to school after holidays and suddenly being hit by this kind of deluge of news about this new technology that was gonna change everything. Um, and if you saw my earlier videos, any, anywhere between January and March or so, there was still an awful lot of talk about plagiarism and detectors and all of that kind of early stage panic, which always made me think a little bit about us educators being a little bit like on the five stages of grief. Um, uh, if you've seen that, that lovely uh, wave, and we were definitely in that early kind of anger slash denial, I think, for a few months now we're probably a little bit further on uh, into hopefully hopeful resignation, per perhaps. I'm not sure, but I think the reality is, is, is there that we absolutely have to be figuring out what to do, not about AI, but with AI. And for anyone who watches the news uh, on AI, if you can avoid it, you will know that there has been an awful lot happening literally in the last week. So I'll tell you a little bit about that in my in my slides as well, but I'll try to focus essentially what my plan is, is I'm going to talk for about the first 20 minutes or so. I'm going to flip through an awful lot of slides quite quickly. So don't worry, I will slow down uh, by about the, the 20 minute or 30 minute mark, and then I'll we'll start to, to talk about what all of this means. But for the first bit, I just want to get anyone who hasn't been completely submerged in this world like I've been for the last, you know, 10 months, a little bit up to speed um, so that we're all kind of speaking the same language because I think that's that's a, a good place for us all to start. So this is not meant to make you feel overwhelmed. It's just to get you up to speed uh, because my short elevator pitch to everybody is it's about a lot more than chat GPT. So with that in mind, uh, I'll, I'll get started. Oh, well, I'll try to get started. So here we go. Here we go. So I always start with the same slide, actually, when I talk about AI, because I think that this article that was published now four years ago is incredibly telling about how we often feel in academia about not just AI, but maybe ed tech in, 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 in full. And particularly, I think post COVID, a lot of educators have a lot of what we hear as ed tech fatigue. And of course, a little bit of post COVID trauma you know, we had to do an awful lot awfully quickly during COVID. And I think there's a sense that, oh God, not another thing. You know, I thought we were over it. I thought we'd have a break and instead it's just more and it feels like an awful lot. So the good news and the bad news is that it's not new, that this stuff has actually been going on for over 20 years. And I'll, I, I am the living evidence of that fact. I've been working in this area since 1999. So I'll bore you with some of that later on, but just to say that there's an awful lot coming up, but we also have an awful lot behind us in terms of experience that can guide us on this path. So before I launch into my scary set of slides, just rest assured, there actually is a foundation for us to work with uh, and lots of, lots of good educational practice that we can use as, as models and as bases from which to, to, to work with AI. But first of all, Anthony Picciano's rather depressing quote from his article, even more depressingly entitled, AI and the Academy's Loss of Purpose. I think for the first probably three, as I said, three to four months of 2023, we saw an awful lot of existential angst from educators, an awful lot of hand wringing, justified, you know, completely justified worry about what this meant for our, our sector, for knowledge, for learning, for education as a whole what what did it what did all of this mean for us not least for our jobs and for our kids jobs what the future holds uh, but as he said says there i suppose that the, the kind of the reality bites uh bit is that 
this is just the start. And in fact, I don't have a slide in this presentation on it, but if you were a, a, if you were a group of innovators and, 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 and entrepreneurs, I would have shared a slide on the so-called sixth wave of innovation, which is really where we are. Uh, you know, we started on this so-called sixth wave, which was predicted, you know, decades ago, these so-called waves of innovation were predicted by Joseph Schumpeter uh, as these kind of 20, 30, 40 year episodes of innovation that would be defined by certain technologies. And the fifth wave was digital technologies, digital networks. We all saw it, social media, et cetera, et cetera. And then that started to wane, they say, somewhere around 2015 and 16, notably the, the kind of the, the point in history where they say that started to decline in terms of credibility uh, and trustworthiness, the issue of the web not being trustworthy and what you see online not being trustworthy was the election of Donald Trump uh, as the American president. And that's really the mark, the marker really in the kind of public consciousness of where digital technologies and that whole area of social media started to get a big question mark around it in terms of how much can we trust what we see online? How much do, can we trust what people say? How much do we even know is real? Uh, and the reason I mention that is that these are really uh, critical issues, first of all, but just to say that they didn't start with AI, which of course, incidentally, has also been around for decades, you know, since the, the 60s anyway, and it has been in all of our LMSs uh, for, for years in terms of learning analytics. So my point is, it feels new right now, because this wave is quite new, about three years old, but really uh, the GPT era in, in our world started 10 months ago, uh, but it's not new and it's also just the beginning. So we need to, I think, jump on board, you know, whether or not we are willing or not. And this is the good time to do it because things are accelerating at a, at a speed that is really, frankly, totally overwhelming for most of us watching this space. So with that in mind, just a very quick refresher in case you're not sure what these technologies even are. These are the technologies that define and that drive that so-called sixth wave of innovation. You know, these are the technologies that are part of our so-called fourth industrial revolution. Web3 as well, blockchain, digital identities, all of that is very much from the digital era starting again around the mid 2010s. But really when we talk about Web 4.0 and Industry 4.0 and Education 4.0, we're talking about these technologies that are really characterized by human computer integration. So we are now well into a period in which the way that we work with technology, with tools and technologies, it is us working with them. They are not as external to us as they used to be. And definitely we see it with robotics quite visually and obviously physically, uh, but in every other way too. If you have a, a heating system or an alarm system at home that you activate with a remote control or from, from your car, you're using the internet of things. If you have an Alexa or any other one of those, you know, voice uh, commanded assistants, if you use Siri, if you use anything like that, you're already well into that space of the internet of things where you're using these tools to make your life easier and to help you perform certain tasks. So this is the this is the group of web 4.0 technologies that of which AI is a part and definitely the most important part I would say and the one that's interacting with all the other parts. So fast forward to where we are now with us. I'm not going to go through December to March, because honestly, things have changed so much that I'm not sure that it would be very useful to go through it with you. That's ancient history now, truthfully, in terms of where we are with generative AI. Where I like to start is mid-March. Mid-March, March 14th is the date that OpenAI released GPT-4. So another improvement on GPT, which started years ago, and then we had GPT-2, then we had GPT-3, and then we all started listening to the news about GPT-3.5, as of March, we had GPT-4 and it really started to get things moving because while in those early days, educators, some, some I might even say slightly a little too, um, maybe presumptuously, assumed that this wouldn't impact on their teaching or their research or their marking, because as a lot of articles and quotes I read said, Oh, I can tell it was generated by a bot. Oh, I could, I could tell the difference between an AI generated essay and one that my students would create. Oh, it's there. I'd give it a solid C, you know, um, and these, 
slightly self-congratulatory, you know, assessments of what GPT 3.5 could do. All of that went out the window in March, because what happened in March with GPT-4 was that it improved incredibly quickly. And the exams that it hadn't done so well on before in the blue, suddenly it, the, the results had skyrocketed in terms of what it was able to do on standardized testing and exams. So this was where people started to pay attention. With GPT-4, it's increased capabilities, but also because of the fact that if you're a subscriber to GPT-4, you also get a whole bunch of add-ons. And those add-ons are the ones that are making all of the headlines today, if you're watching the news today. And I'll, I'll, I'll get onto that as well. So very quickly, some of those add-ons are things like this, plugins. There's a plugin store, which essentially gives you access to hundreds, if not thousands of apps that are freely available, if you subscribe, that is. And you can choose your top three so that they're there, they're readily available for you. And you can interact with those apps in GPT-4 to perform certain tasks. So essentially it is accelerating and increasing your ability to perform certain tasks by having it in the generative AI tool. So for example, on the bottom left, you can see just a few examples. Some of the popular ones are things like Ask My PDF, where you can upload a PDF. And I did a little test there on a very obscure publication that I, I wrote about 11 years ago now, which I knew was not online because it was just in a very obscure journal. So I thought, this is it hasn't been trained on my work. I'm going to see if it can do something with it. So I uploaded a PDF and I asked it. Again, a rather difficult question, which was what was the significance of the frog in this piece of performance art that I went to see 11 years ago in Canada? And it gave me a really great response. So, you know, just a little demo of what it can do. There's lots of other ones you can interact with video, scholar AI, so you can do research, you can do video insights. And very recently, just two or three weeks ago, Canva, a very popular tool, has now uh, announced that it's also got a GPT plugin. So just to say, plugins give you a lot more capability. Uh, GPT-4 also had something which was then called Code Interpreter and has since been uh, since been renamed since the release of ChatGPT Enterprise. But again, essentially what Code Interpreter did would allow, was allow you to create, to write code by entering a prompt. So again, I did something kind of silly off the cuff. I'm always trying to practice my Spanish. So I said, you know, create a code that will allow me to hear my emails in Spanish. And it went ahead and it said, well, I can't actually do all this for you, but I can help the, you know, I can create the Python script and it went ahead and did it. Now, if you're curious to see more examples in detail of all of these, I strongly recommend that you follow Ethan Mollick, who many of you will have heard of by now. He's a professor of entrepreneurship at the Wharton School in Pennsylvania, and he's got a blog called One Useful Thing. He has been doing really, really high profile and very incredibly creative experiments in how to use generative AI since January. And he and his partner who worked, they'd worked together at the Wharton School, they also have a series of five videos on YouTube, which is called something like Gen, I for, Gen AI for educators. So if you want to follow someone, I would strongly recommend following him and his partner just to get an idea of some of the ways they use Gen AI. Here's some other uh, tools and things that have been happening since, since about March or so. This is not GPT-4 now because there's lots of other chatbots out there, lots of other large language models, lots of other uh, cloud providers, which I'll get into later as well. Basically, there's layers of competition going from the bots to the LLMs, to the providers, to the cloud, to frankly, national governments. So we have on the left, we have Perplexity, which was the solution to the earlier uh, kind of complaint that GPT didn't give citations, it wasn't connected to the internet, it couldn't provide anything really useful. That all went out the window with, with of course, later versions of GPT. Uh, also Bing Chat, which is connected to the internet, but perplexity is a wonderful one there, where it gives you citations and links to the sources that it used to answer your questions. So perplexity.ai is one of the ones that I like to recommend because I find it frankly better than a lot of the other ones. Uh, the one in the middle there is another one that's made huge news and again, big news in the last two days and it's called uh, Claude by a company called Anthropic. So Anthropic is famous because it has a context window that is way larger than any of the other chatbots. And what that means is the context window is where you enter your prompt. And context window just refers to the amount of tokens in your prompt. So again, you don't get need to get too deep into the computer science lingo of any of this, but all you really need to know is that the bigger the context window, the more you can enter. And 
Anthropics Claude made news months ago because its context window was 100,000 tokens large in size. <laughs> That's a way to express it, which was in layman's terms, if you work in a faculty of humanities like I do, where you work a lot with text, it was equivalent to the length of the book, The Great Gatsby. So suddenly our ears perked up and we went, okay, if you're teaching a literature class, you're teaching a, any kind of an interdisciplinary studies class, any kind of critical theory, any kind of poli-sci anthropology, any class that, that focuses on large texts using something like perplexity or Claude, now Claude 2, or using Ask Your PDF, those are all really, really useful tools because you can either upload a PDF or, or link to a whole work and interact with that work in the chat bot. So you're not just asking it questions like a search tool because it's not a search tool. It's a chat bot, it's conversational AI. And you get the best results when you have a conversation with it and when you iterate. So it's not a Google search bar. It's not a, a Bing search bar, it's a conversation. And I think that's probably one of the most important things you need to remember when you're experimenting with these tools is that it's about iterating and it's about improving and asking for a different result and asking it to tweak what it's given you in some way. That's how you're gonna get the best results. So by about July of this summer, again, this is Ethan Mollick's uh, website there on the bottom left. I've given you the, the link in case you'd like to have a look. This specific uh, blog post was a summary of essentially where he said Gen AI had gotten to by summer 2023 and showing all of the different chatbots that he was using, just a little bit of a comparison. And I'll share these slides with you. So don't worry about writing anything down. I'll, I'm happy to share these afterwards, but these are all quite useful in terms of just for your own learning and your own comparison. So not only can it do things like answer basic questions, but it can write content, it can create images, videos, it can brainstorm with you. Uh, it can provide all kinds of uh, ways for you to you know, interrogate data, uh, have conversations. Uh, and Mike Sharple is another very well-known um, name in education technology has provided a list, which again, I'll get to later, of some of the uses for ChatGPT and other chatbots in terms of digital education, how you can use it as uh, things like a Socratic opponent, or maybe a live assessor, um, or maybe a debate coach, for example. So there are, awfully lot, there are an awful lot of ways that you can use these chatbots quite creatively in your practice that go beyond text, that go into areas like computer science, writing code, correcting code, data analysis, advanced data analysis, data visualization. So there's an awful lot you can do there and a lot more as I think you can probably gather other than generating essays, which people were worried about back in January and about cheating. It is honestly about just so more than that, so much more than that. So the last literally week, probably three days or so, we've seen a whole bunch of announcements uh, and they're all about basically the competition between Google and OpenAI. So I won't go again too deep into the industry background, but suffice it to say that there's a huge battle happening in ed tech, in, in big tech right now between Google, OpenAI, and as of yesterday, Amazon as well has joined the fray. So I'll fill you in on that again a few slides later. But for our purposes, what you need to know is that BARD and ChatGPT are now multimodal. And what that means is they can both work with images. And in fact, GPT can work with more than images. So I'll go on to that again on the next slide. That image there on the top left where it says, tell me about your photo. I uploaded that photo from a walk that I was on in August when I was in the middle of nowhere in Ireland. <laughs> and I took a photograph of this cute little cardboard, looked like a fairy door that someone had stuck to a tree. And I thought, hmm, this might be a good test for a chat bot. So I uploaded and I just said, tell me about this photo. And it created this lovely little story, which frankly is very credible about fairy doors and what they signify and what it might mean in terms of being in uh, a portal to another world, et cetera, et cetera. So very creative, but also actually quite correct in terms of the way we think about these things. So what's happened now in the last couple of days is that BARD has gone from not just being multimodal in terms of being able to talk about images and have you upload images, but it also now has extensions. So BARD extensions, I would say, are comparable to GPT's plugins. 
It's essentially the same idea. They just give them different names in different engines. So BARD's extensions allow you now to interact with BARD in different areas of whatever you use in Google Workspace. So if you use Google Workspace in your day-to-day -day life, you have email, you have, um, you know, you use the, um, I want to use uh, uh, OpenAI or Microsoft terminology, but if you want to use the equivalent of Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, et cetera, but the Google version, Google Slides, et cetera, you can now say to Bard, go and look at all my emails, for example, from 2022, and tell me what was the most important theme that emerged from my discussions with so-and-so, for example. Or go and look at all of the images I have uploaded in the last five years and create you know, some kind of a summary that tells me what was important to me in my life. These are just kind of silly examples, but this is theoretically what it's able to do. Now, I will be honest and tell you that an awful lot of these early days announcements are way too early days. And the reason that they do this early day announcement and they essentially over promise on what's really available is because they're all competing. So Bard has released this, Google has released this in the last few days because really they are in this kind of battle with open AI right now. So just be aware of that as well. One of the interesting additions though that I thought to Bard in the last few days is this, uh, this capability that you can see on the bottom right, which is that you can ask Bard a question, but it will also now, because Google's Bard is much more careful than OpenAI's GPT, it will give you an analysis of how correct or reliable its response might be. So this is very obviously a response to everyone's criticism about the fact that um, Generative AI hallucinates, which is fancy lingo for it makes mistakes, but it doesn't admit its mistake that much. It makes stuff up instead because it likes to sound authoritative and credible because that's how it's programmed to be. It's not a sentient being. It's a predictive statistical machine, right? So it's there to please you and give you a response. So if it doesn't have the answer, it will make one up that sounds good in order to make you happy and give you the answer that you wanted. So I did a little test because I'm endlessly fascinated, first of all, with Elon Musk and his crazy life. Um, and I was looking into uh, a little bit of what he's been up to over the last the last week or so, uh, and, and I was curious about his relationship with Grimes, the Canadian musician who's made the news in the last few months because she, she's one of the few musicians that when AI generated music came out, she came out and said, I'd be happy for you to use my voice to create AI generated music. In fact, go ahead and do it. Just make sure you pay me some royalty. So she put herself out there in front in terms of artists who are not just okay with using generative AI or have their voices cloned, et cetera, to create a generative art, but she actually was actively one of the kind of co-producers in it. So anyway, she was on my mind, Elon Musk was on my mind for other reasons. So I, I put in this question, why, you know, why, why have they named their, their child Techno? Because they have a child whose name is Techno Mechanicus. I don't know if you know that, but that kind of blew my mind as well. Um, and I was curious to know why they would name a child that. Uh, why would you do that to a poor kid? Uh, so I put that in and it gave me a few examples of answers. Uh, and, and of course I thought, well, which, which is the correct answer? So interestingly, here's what it does. It, it rates the answers in terms of green saying it's kind of a credible, reliable answer. And then in orange, these are kind of maybe. I gave you this because I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling at straws here, trying to give you something. So this is Bard's way of, of, I suppose, classifying or categorizing its responses into levels of risk, which I think is quite interesting and quite useful. And Bard has always been like this since the early days. It's always said, this is an experiment. You cannot trust these results. You have to take them you know, for what it is, which is an experiment. So that's what's going on on the Google end. Google, which has always been a little bit more careful. Google, which basically got pushed, you could say, into releasing some of this over the last year, really as a response to OpenAI's plowing ahead. Uh, and then of course with Microsoft's 10 billion uh, investment in OpenAI, which has really made the two of them a powerhouse. So the other news, literally, <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot say this talk is not right up to cutting edge news. This happened yesterday. In fact, last night slash this morning, people were talking about this. So OpenAI has announced now that uh, ChatGPT4 can see and hear. And of course, we always have to put these things in, in, in quotation marks. Okay, when I say things like understand, I, I try not to ever use the word think, but when I say things like understand, I mean it in the sense that it seems like it will understand because we have to remember this is a, 
a generative AI tool. It doesn't understand anything. It's generating output based on probability, right? It's a statistical probability predictive machine. That's what it is. It, uh, 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 if you follow you know, the computer science terminology on it, it's a stochastic parrot, right? So you can go and read on that if you're interested. Emily Bender has some really good work uh, on that area if you're interested in learning more about that, that side of it and the criticism of it. But for us for now, GPT-4, the big news as of last night was that it can see and hear. So what this means is now GPT-4 is also multimodal. So it can see in here, it means it can read images. So the, the example they put on Twitter, and it's all over the internet today, is you can upload this, this picture of your bicycle, for example. This is the demo they gave, um, you know, basically asking for help. How, how can I lower my bike seat? So here's a lovely one for the Netherlands life. We know you all love your bicycles. What if you have a problem with your bike and you're out and about? Well, you can open your chat GPT-4 app on your phone, presuming you're a subscriber, you have access to these plus features, and you can say, help me lower my bike seat. And it will walk you through what you need to do in order to solve your problem. Now, I haven't uploaded the video just because it would be too difficult to go ahead and, and, and play that from here while I'm also on Zoom. But if you go and you look at that demo, it also goes into a further uh, multimodal test where the user uploads a picture of their uh, box of Allen keys that they use to fix their bike. And they say, well, which key do I use? Which tool should I use? And GPT then looks at the toolkit that they upload and says, okay, if you look at the left corner, you'll see one with this name on it. That's the one you need. And then you need to do this. So this is pretty mind blowing stuff, quite frankly. And you know, like already people who are you know experts commentating on this field from all kinds of areas are saying, this is going to change the way we use the internet. You know, and I said at some point a few minutes ago that you can't use conversational AI like a search engine. It's not a search engine. It's a chatbot. But I think what we're starting to see now as these capabilities are changing is that what we used to use as search, we will probably now start to do things that are much more interactive. And uh, I don't know about you, but I often go on to Google or another search engine and I ask really basic, how can I do this? How can I find that? Where is this? What do you think of that? You know, we've kind of become accustomed to doing searches where we put in the key terms because we know about things like SEO right now um, to get the result that we want. So I think this is now changing that direction a little bit. So having said all that about Google and OpenAI, I now want to come back and say, it's not just about these guys. It's about an awfully bigger ecosystem of generative AI tools that's out there that are all based on the handful of large language models by OpenAI, by Google, by, by other providers. But there are literally thousands of generative AI tools out there. So again, if you want to do some experimenting, and I think those of you who stay on for the workshop today, you're going to be doing some experimenting. These are two databases that you can search uh, to find uh, a generative AI tool, tool that will uh, fit your purposes. Uh, and as it says there, Futurepedia, there's tools added every single day. You can filter by what you want to do or the kind of tool. Uh, so the person there, it says, I want help with my maths homework, but you can look for avatars, audio editing, editing. you can look for tools for certain industries, et cetera. And it's the exact same with the one on the bottom right, which is the AI rundowns um, database of tools. So those are two I would bookmark, as well as obviously BARD, GPT, et cetera, whatever you want to try and use. But please just be aware that there is that data, there is a, a huge ecosystem of AI tools. And that's really where we're going to find, I think, a lot of it, it, um, interesting developments happening. So on that note, a slightly a slight change, of course, but not really more building on kind of what I've been saying about multimodal image search uh, and the capabilities of GPT-4. I think that what we're really, really seeing and what needs to be clear is that we are now, as I said, we have transitioned from this era of web, web two, web three, even maybe three is still here to web four, where we've gone from digital media, digital media production, digital media creation, uh, to, to now what we're starting to see emerge, which is synthetic media. So we have synthetic um, video production, we have synthetic um, PowerPoint, you know, presentation production. You can add uh, a prompt to a website generator there on the bottom, uh, and it will generate a website for you literally in about two minutes. You can, as it says there, this is the, the tagline for, I think it was Runway AI. It gives you everything you need to make anything you want. Now, again, slight exaggeration, the demos, the websites, the promises, they're always a little bit inflated. Uh, my experiment with Runway is, is the bottom right there, this slightly strange avatar space alien looking woman where I think my prompt was something like, show me a 
female academic coming to university. <laughs> I got something that looks a bit like the Avatar film, if anybody remembers that. So again, not quite what the demos show, but these things are improving by the day. The, the image on the top left is the one, the, the viral image of the Pope in a puffy that went viral in March or April or so, which I think was what really caught people's attention and showed us that these images could be generated. And the Pope was not actually walking around in a Balenciaga puffy. <laughs> and I doubt he ever has. But in this image, people were wondering, did Pope Francis, you know, buy in and start buying really nice winter wear? Uh, and that, and again, on the right, we see, uh, you know, Van Gogh's uh, starry night, but adapted with the New York City skyline. So we're seeing, you know, we saw these early experiments in photography, in art. Then we started to see the emergence of under starry night there, Adobe Fireflies capabilities where you could do something called in painting or zooming out, which essentially means creating a different background to the image that you had. So you can put that girl with the red hair with the snowy background. You could put her on a beach, in a city, in a classroom, anywhere you like. So all of this, and then the ones on the very bottom, I added those two beside each other, the lion and the and the mountain, because that is a really interesting cool tool called Drag Gan, very strange name. But essentially what you can do there is you don't even have to enter a text prompt. You can literally hover your cursor where that red little dot is, and you can open and shut the lion's mouth by moving your cursor. So you don't actually even have to say, edit this now, make it, create that image again with the lion's mouth open or make that mountain higher. You literally just grab it and make it higher yourself. So all of this is just to say that synthetic media is allowing us to create everything in real time and, and edit it. It's also giving us synthetic voices and synthetic people. Uh, which is frankly both wonderful and terrifying. And again, I think if you watch the news, you'll see some really uh, kind of shocking and horrible stories starting to come out, but also some really, really interesting and positive use cases for us in education. So it's all about how we use these. So Eleven Labs is one is a, a group that's gotten an awful lot of publicity in the last few months. They are the ones, this is a demo on the top right there, sorry, top left of David Attenborough. Uh, they put this video of David Attenborough speaking in English on, for, uh, in, on their website. And then as he was speaking, he instantly transitioned to saying the same tech, same words, but in German and then French and then Spanish and then Dutch or whatever languages he was doing just to show that it could seamlessly transition from one language to another. So that so that means we're not just at kind of, you know, text to text to image, but we're also at, you know, basically being able to use and clone these synthetic voices to then have my own voice. I could this video afterwards, I could create it in Dutch. Maybe we should maybe we should look at that for next time so I don't stumble over my words, you know. Um Meta there beside that just about three or four weeks ago released something called Seamless M4T which allows you to generate instant speech to speech translation, uh, text to speech translation. So you can literally, again, put in a sentence in, in Dutch, in Spanish, in Japanese, and you can translate it to another language and, and it will also speak it for you. So I think you'll probably agree that the, the potential for this in terms of international studies in terms of breaking down, you know, linguistic and physical geographical boundaries for education are tremendous. They are really, really exciting, but they also require us to be incredibly careful because we also have bizarre and frankly dangerous examples and bizarre are the ones that I've included on the bottom. You know, we have things like synthetic Trump and Biden having an endless debate on Twitch TV, which is absolutely laden with profanity that should come with a a, a warning, let me just tell you. But if you go to Twitch TV, you can watch synthetic Trump and Biden having an endless face off, which is entertaining for about a minute and then becomes a bit old, frankly. But it's pretty intriguing just to see what you can do. Uh, and then if you're feeling a little disgusting after that and you need to repent, you can go over to Twitch TV's channel for AI Jesus and you can input your prompt and you can ask AI Jesus for some advice. And AI Jesus will generate a response to you as you are watching it on Twitch TV. So again, some kind of weird, bizarre uses, you know, which are more entertaining than, than useful, but they give an indication of the kinds of things we can do. Uh, the AI girlfriend, we might snicker at that, but AI companions is one of the largest and most fast growing sectors in generative AI right now. And on a serious note, 
Some people are saying that these AI companions, which are incredibly popular, might actually solve some of the crisis that we have in terms of loneliness, anxiety, uh, you know, social anxiety disorders, people who are you know, suffering in some way or other and are finding it difficult to interact with people in, in the real world, and that maybe these could actually assist. So the one on the top, sorry, above that is 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 one that really, again, blew my mind when I when I happened upon it. It's called uh, Here and After. And again, if you have the voice recording of a loved one who might have departed this world uh, recently, you can upload that and you can continue to have a conversation with your dead relative or friend or companion, whoever it is. And again, you might you might think this is horrific. But on the other hand, for some people that might offer closure, you know, so there's there's positive and there's negatives to all of this. And I suppose that's what I want to say is that we don't exactly know what is the best way to use them, but we know we don't want to see horror stories like came out of what came out of Spain last week, which was a story about a group of teenage girls in Estremadura who uh, woke up one day to the shocking, uh, disturbing messages that they were receiving on a WhatsApp group, where I don't know if you know this, but on WhatsApp, you can send an image that is programmed to disappear within a minute, like the Snapchat images can. Um, and they were receiving images of, of themselves, which looked like themselves, but naked. And and then the images would disappear. So they were getting messages saying, did you know that there are being there are, you know, nude photos of you being distributed on WhatsApp? And of course, panic and shame and outrage. And some wanted to talk to their parents about it and some didn't. Um, and of course, these images, it turned out, were generated by AI. And it was basically a joke by, you know, a bunch of teenage boys who probably weren't thinking it through. Um, which is now getting an awful lot of attention in Spain and is drawing attention to the idea, you know, to the reality that we need to be really thinking seriously about uh, the ty types of tools that are freely available on the internet and maybe whether or not it's that we should be targeting, you know, the companies, the startups that create those tools that teenage boys who haven't thought it through go ahead and use for a joke but cause an awful lot of harm. So again, an awful lot going on in the background in terms of risk, responsibility, the need for regulation, all of these conversations are happening, you know, again, at, at lightning speed, and they need to be happening in every country. And they are happening. But unfortunately, they're not happening fast enough, because the tools are emerging so quickly that we can't keep up. And the regulators can't keep up. So again, I think knowledge is power. We really have to be aware of what's going on here and keeping an eye on it so that again, you can protect your students yourselves so that you can be aware that you could be scammed or something horrible could happen. Uh, because of these the, these tools and their availability as well. So that's my that's my public safety warning part. Now on the more helpful uh, and, and productive uh, side, we also have things like AI buddies and tutors, which again, debuted months ago. Uh, Khan Academy announced very high profile. It's uh, Khan Migo, which is beautifully named AI tutor. Those of you who speak Spanish will get the joke, but Khan Migo in Spanish means with me. So this is a tutor that you can have with you for the duration of your educational journey that will tutor you as you go through a course or through a program. Snapchat also has an AI buddy that they pinned to the homepage of their tool, which very interestingly received very negative feedback from teenagers who were using Snapchat, who instantly protested at the invasion of their privacy. So lest anyone think teenagers are not astute when it comes to issues around digital privacy uh, and all of that, they, they actually are quite aware of the risks and they are very quick to speak up and complain, but it hasn't changed the fact that that's still there on, on the AI, on the Snapchat AI's homepage. There are others as well. There is Poe, there's Pi, which is a so-called empathetic AI where you can speak to it about your problems. You can choose the kind of voice you want it to have. Poe was created by the, um, the website Quora. I think Pi was created by the founder of LinkedIn. They're all linked to bigger pre-existing tech companies. None of these are brand new. They're all startups coming from companies that already exist. Some of the really interesting ones that I think for our purposes hold a lot of promises are, are the applications of those AI agents, tutors, buddies in social spaces. So when we think about social learning, you know, if you're doing it online, you'll be thinking about things like discussion for us, stuff like that. Not particularly Web 4.0, you would probably agree. Pretty out of date, a bit clunky and very easy to plagiarize. Um, I have a friend who was teaching online this summer and she complained that all of her students were, she suspected, 
creating their discussion forum posts with chat GPT. And uh, my response was, of course they are. <laughs> Why wouldn't they? You know, you need to be updating that. You need to be looking at, at what's going on. And, and it instantly made me think about this. That maybe this would be a solution, for example, in virtual spaces where character AI, for example, this is one of the absolute darlings of the startups right now. Character AI has proven to be very popular. You can choose a real or a fictional character from history or the present and you can have a conversation. And again, it comes with the warning. You'll see it there. Remember, everything characters say is made up. They all come with a warning, but they can be quite interesting and useful tools. Probably more on the educational front is the one that I've included on the right, Circle Chat. I, I really quite like this one. And again, I just have to say I'm not plugging and I'm not working for any of these companies, but this is just my own kind of unbiased um, experimentation of what I, what I like. So Circle Chat, um, I found quite interesting because you can have several AI agents that uh, take on multiple perspectives. So again, I was uh, a little bit in a Spanish space this summer. I was in Spain twice and I do a bit of work in Spain from time to time and I've lived there several times. So I'm always thinking about Spain and I was following the election uh, this summer and I was watching closely what was happening with the, the election there. And I was thinking about Spanish history and, and, and populism and what's happening in, in Europe generally. And I said, you know, what can what can we learn from the Spanish Civil War about populist politics? I said, let's let's put that in and see see what it gives me. And it was really interesting. So it gave me these six different characters and they all gave me a different take on the elections and what was going on and what it might tell us about populism. So I thought that was a really interesting case right there. And one that I would like to see explored in the context of social collaborative learning. Just last week, again, another announcement that I included there, just the news headline, because I literally haven't seen it yet. But Meta is paying attention to what's going on with character AI, and they are now promising or threatening, depending on how you look at it, to release um, chatbots, AI chatbot characters, but for younger users. So again, like your eyebrows might raise at that and think, oh God, do we need these for younger users? But the fact is, our kids are in these virtual spaces. I think educators who deny that or try to avoid that are deceiving themselves. Our kids are already on their phones, playing computer games, interacting in virtual you know, social spaces. So why wouldn't they be exposed to this? You know, um, So they are saying that they're gonna create these personalities. I heard a very funny news report on it yesterday uh, because one of the personalities is, is has got a kind of a silly name and it's, SAS Master Jazz or something. There you go, SAS Master General. It's there in the news clipping. Uh, and that's supposed to be one of the robots. And the criticism was, I don't know how in touch with Meta really is with kids these days if they think they're really going to want to talk to a robot called SAS Master General. So I'll, I leave that with you to check with your kids, but um, it's coming. So that's a little bit of the kind of, you know, th those are some of the, the most recent developments. And just to step back a little bit, just to put it into the context, the reason all of this is coming at us in the flurry that it is, is because there is a massive, as I said, face off happening between big tech, right? And that is really what is driving a lot of these really, really quick announcements and frankly, sometimes premature announcements of tools that are not really ready for public consumption quite yet. So again, way back, it feels like ancient history now, maybe March, April, June or so, OpenAI uh, announced they were going to be releasing Copilot. Copilot has just now been announced that it would be released today. Starting today, September 26th, OpenAI is starting to integrate uh, their, your everyday AI companion into all of their, uh, all of their tools. So if you use Microsoft Teams or Word or Excel or any of those in your work or in your home, you now or very shortly will have access to this co-pilot AI companion that will help you through your daily work. Now, the wonderful thing about this is it often offers an amazing amount of productivity and efficiency, I think, for certain workplace um, applications. There's no doubt that university administration recruitment, retention, communication, a lot of this that we've already seen trials, you know, with AI for, for years, that will that will now be escalated and accelerated thanks to Copilot. Um, 
We also, a few weeks ago, we saw GPT uh, announced GPT Enterprise, which was a very obvious response to the criticism that was coming from a lot of people in enterprise and, and in other areas saying, we, we love this tool, but we don't trust it with our data. Uh, notably, there was a case in January or February where some poor, unwitting Samsung employee uploaded some sensitive company data into GPT to ask a question. And of course, that released Samsung, Samsung's private data into the public domain, which resulted in Samsung and many other companies banning the use of ChatGPT on their systems. So ChatGPT Enterprise is a response to that. Right, it's offering stricter guardrails, more privacy uh, around all of these. So that's the other thing that's happening is this integration and also the the, the growth of private LLMs um, with with large companies where they have their own guardrails and they can use LLMs in their own on their just on their own data. So I mentioned that because one thing that's been really clear to me for the last six months or so is that what's happening in the corporate world. And, and in industry, which often feels quite removed from us in academia, is very relevant to us in academia, whether we like it or not, whether we're aware of it or not, because ed tech is following what is happening in the corporate world. Very, very literally in some cases, I'm gonna show you one in a minute. Now, this is almost a year ago, this little image here of the AI, Gen AI, Gen AI ed tech landscape. That's a tough sentence to say. Uh, from late January. And you'll recognize some of those startups, I'm sure. Elicit, there is a Gen AI research tool. Quizlet, quite well known now. Knowledge, an online e-learning authoring uh, generative tool. Copilot's already on there. Um, Jasper is up there along with Duolingo. Jasper is the one that I'm gonna talk to you about in just a second. Um, but all of these tools were already here now almost a year ago. And the, the, the landscape is growing at an incredibly rapid pace. If you look at the industry context, there are literally thousands, thousands of AI, machine learning, data, you know, processing and, and analysis tools. And you'll notice too that this screenshot comes from a company called Reach Capital. And I mention that because there's a huge amount of money in this, right? So EdTech is very astutely paying attention to what's going on and people are getting on board. And this is, again, not new. This is not because Gen AI is here. It's just accelerating a pre-existing trend, which is that investors are aware that digital learning and now Gen AI is big money. So here's what I was referring to a second ago, just to show you exactly how EdTech is following the corporate landscape. Jasper AI was out before ChatGPT 3.5. Jasper AI, AI was out in 2022. And this is a tool that was marketed, as it says there, pretty obviously towards text heavy industries. So marketing, PR, communicate, corporate communications, et cetera. And you can see some of the, you can see the promise. It wants to ask you to, to write your copy for free. And then it gives you on the right some templates. Okay, maybe I want to create a problem solution framework. Maybe I want to summarize some text. Maybe I want to write a blog post. So what you do is you go onto this platform, you put in your prompt, you say what it is that you'd like to generate and it generates it for you. So this is a formula. This is the formula that we're seeing over and over and over again with these platforms, which is that there's a, there's a basic LLM foundation. There's a wrapper around it, Jasper AI. They're wrapping it for a specific industry. And then there are templates specific to that industry. So now look at these. This is what's happening in EdTech. There has been a mushrooming of growth of EdTech startups as well in the last year that are doing very, very similar things. So for example, Magic School AI looks incredibly similar. That interface looks incredibly similar to what you just saw with Jasper AI. And they're doing the same thing. They're offering you templates with which to create your content, your quizzes, your lesson plans, whatever it is that you'd like to do. You can generate learning content with these resource generators. You can also access tools that will expedite assessment feedback, which we all know is something students always talk about. They want more feedback, they want it promptly, they want it to be personal, they want it to be you know, something that they can use. They want it to be developmental. 
So again, we're hearing an awful lot about authentic assessment as a supposed response, maybe, to you know some of the some of the more outmoded um, means of assessment that we we have used for decades in academia. The essay is the obvious one, but there are many others. Um, so authentic assessment is the is supposedly the you know the the cure all to that because it's based in authentic reality, I suppose. I don't really know what an inauthentic assessment would look like, truthfully. But I mean, it refers in the lingo, it refers to, you know, um, job-based, skills-based, industry-based. What are you going to be doing in real life? How does it relate to you personally and your experience? So authentic assessment is, we hope, a way to maybe get past the more kind of generic Gen AI uh, generated um, content and also assessment production. These are some of the tools for e-learning generation. Some of them I just showed you on that on that uh, screenshot from the from the investor group. Knowledge AI is the one I was talking about that offers to generate an e-learning course for you in seconds. Now, this to me is a classic example of overpromising because this has been out since early in this year, and I tested it early and I test it often because it is interesting, but it doesn't generate a course for you. What it does is it generates flip cards study tools, short pieces, the kinds of things you, just, you can do in GPT right now yourself, but it does it instantly for you in this tool. So make no mistake, this is not a course. This is content generation. And there's a difference in my mind, a very big difference. Um, in terms of integration, this is where it's happening. When I said EdTech is following big industry, those AI tutors and bots that we saw, they are now being integrated into learning management systems. So now I think... Donna said that you use Blackboard where you are, but Instructure is another big one. Canvas is their LMS. They announced about a month ago that they were going to be integrating Canmigo. So that's one avenue that one LMS company has chosen to go down, the personalized AI tutor avenue. Blackboard, on the other hand, is going more for the design generation approach, which is quite interesting to me, because to me what this says is, First of all, they're going to offer to make synthetic media production easy for, for lecturers, for professors, for instructors. You can auto-generate all of the content that takes a while for you to think about creating for a course. You know, question banks, quizzes, rubrics, something we really need to be using. Rubrics, I don't see enough of them. Um, and also image generation. So all of what I showed you earlier with the synthetic media that we're able to create now, that is being incorporated into Blackboard's LMS, maybe not quite to that level of sophistication. I don't think they're gonna be do, doing voice cloning tomorrow, but you can see, I think, I hope, that what's happening in ed tech is very clearly following what's happening in the industry, in industry outside. Um, and in this case, it's they call it the AI design assistant. What I also think is relevant about these two LMS examples is that it shows me two very different directions in terms of how ed tech is listening to us or not listening to us. So the AI tutors and bots, they are clearly geared at students, student needs, student problems, maybe responding to student voice. Whereas the Blackboard approach is a different approach, clearly aimed at lecturers, maybe early stage lecturers who are struggling to create content quickly, struggling to prepare things fast enough. Um, so they are offering to really help with that side of things. So on the one hand, you have appealing to students, and maybe responding to student problems. On the other, you have responding more to, I say, what, what the educators might need. So that brings me to here. Tony Bates, one of the absolute heroes in digital education, who's been working at, in this field, well, he's actually recently retired, but was working in this field for 20, 30 years. Canadian academic uh, based at uh, Ryerson University, which has now been renamed Toronto Metropolitan University. I should know that because I've taught there, <laughs> but he's retired now. Um, and he issued a call for papers about three years ago in a journal on uh, where the, the call for papers was basically to address the question, how might AI transform higher education? And he got a pitiful response. He said that in response to his call for papers, he received 26 in total. 26 potential journal articles. And of those 26, five or six were publishable in this special edition. This was in 2020. So this is a quote from the foreword, and I'm sorry, I should have included a link to that journal article. I can, I can send that on. It's a full issue on, on AI and, and, and higher ed. But as I said, it's now three years out of date. 
And it starts with, with his intro. And this is a quote from his intro where he, he basically is complaining about the fact that educators are not engaging with AI. And that he, as he sees it, the reason that he's only gotten five publishable papers is because nobody's responding to his call for papers and they're not responding because they're not engaging. And in fact, most educators are probably not even using the learning analytics function in their LMS, which has been around forever, you know? Uh, and he finds this very worrisome because from the perspective of technology, and I, I have to agree with this, there is a terrible tendency, I think, in higher education, maybe more than other education areas, to sometimes think we're okay and we're safe from this. And I think the early response to GPT 3.5 in January, February, March that said, we, you know, we don't need to worry about this because we can spot an AI generated essay it was a horrible example of our sometimes tendency to feel a bit safer than we actually are. And I don't want to so panic. That's not my that's not my intention here at all. But what I do want to say is we need to be engaged. So I'm first of all, glad that you're all here today because you clearly are engaged. And that's wonderful because we need to be engaged and we need to stay engaged because it's really, really critical, I think, at this juncture, when you see what's happening with the wider industry and you hear about some of the more horrific use cases of Gen AI and you see the way ed tech is following the industry, it is really critical that we as educators use our voice, not just to speak to each other, but to speak to ed tech and to tell them what we want and to talk about the problems that we have and say, here's how you might be able to help us. Because as Tony Bates says, who should control AI and education? It's a rhetorical question, clearly, right? And in 2023, these were hypothetical questions about what would happen if AI became so successful that it could offer to reduce the cost of teaching and learning. That's what those tools I just showed you do. That's what they are for. And all of those tools are marketed using, um, these, these are not the ones now integrated into the LMSs. These are the external resource generators I showed you, but they're all marketed. I can't find a single one that doesn't use the marketing phrase time saving. They're all about saving time. So they are clearly doing what Tony Bates predicted three years ago, which is that they are offering to save time. But as he says, what is the cost to us if we hand over our agency to essentially big tech or ed tech? And I, now I work in ed tech. I am an ed tech person, but I think it is my duty as an ed tech person, as someone who works at the intersection as of both, to speak very openly and honestly about this, because I think it is our duty also as educators to then be involved. Because as he says, the tsunami is here. And I love the fact that this wave comes up over and over again. You know, we have the wave of, of grief, we have the sixth wave of innovation, and now we have this tsunami of AI tools. It's all this metaphor of us hitting it, us in the face and overpowering us. And so I think it's very important that we think about how we can react, not resist, but work with. So a little breath, because now we're going to switch a little bit for the last 10 minutes or so. What do we need to be thinking about? Well, first of all, we need to be thinking about two areas of competencies. What do we need for this AI age? Very clearly, we need to be thinking about the so-called human competencies on the left. And of course, we need to be thinking about the AI competencies on the right. We are barely right now scraping the surface of those first four, I would say. We need to be starting, we need to be embedding those first four. Right now, literacy is urgent, absolutely urgent. Everybody needs to understand how these tools work. You also, skipping down to the fifth one on the right there, you need to be aware that for your own discipline, this has implications. This is not just about generating essays. This is about how, how your practice will change. And again, I direct you back to Ethan Mollick for some very good examples of how your actual practice, your research pro practice will change with the use of GPT and other tools. And I think that reality is just starting now to hit home for some academics where I work as well. I've seen some, some discussions online where people are starting to realize that the early dismissal uh, was too soon and that there are actually really important things to think about in terms of research implications. Obviously for teaching, we've covered that. Uh, and any of you who are following the EU Digital Education Hub's work will recognize those three categories that they their, their hubs on AI have split our work into, which is thinking about teaching about AI for AI and with AI. So if you want to look into that, they have all issued um, reports which are available on the, your, the EU uh, Digital Education Hub as well, if you're a member. And if you're not a member, you just need to register. The ones on the left are problematic for me because 
to be honest with you, already what's happening is this binary is kind of eroding in that we've already got some discussion and quite a debate going on about whether or not AI itself is creative. It's definitely capable of creating, whether or not that means it is creative is a different question. But again, if you're interested in that, there's a lot you can go and look at uh, online in terms of that debate. Uh, critical thinking, there's no doubt it can help us with it, but maybe it's more in terms of we can input something into GPT or other tools, and then we can use that as a, as a, as a starting point for, for, for critical discussion. Collaboration, we can collaborate using AI tools of the kind that I just showed you, uh, but we definitely need to be thinking about leadership in, in all areas, but also in terms of, I think, AI at your school, in your department, uh, who's going to be the person who champions it, who decides to be the person who relays news like this to your colleagues on a, on a regular basis so that you're up to date. And of course, problem solving. I haven't gone into these tools on this because uh, I really didn't want to sow too much panic into anybody. But the next big thing so-called is AI agents, AI autonomous agents, which are tools that will be able to problem solve and are, are able to problem solve right now without a prompt. You don't even need to enter a prompt. So if you use tools like AutoGPT or um, BabyGPT, there's a lot of them out there already as well, and they're getting better. You give it the problem you want to solve, the task you want it to complete, and it breaks it down into the constituent tasks that it needs to complete in order to fulfill your the mission you've given it, and it, and it completes that task. So AI autonomous agents are a really important discussion because frankly, they're the stuff of both dreams and potential nightmares uh, that again, we've seen in some of the media talking about what would happen if an AI agent was given a mission to solve, which included, you know, unfortunately maybe running a child down on the street to get to the other side faster, for example, you know, how are we gonna train those agents to, to complete problems, to solve problems for us without creating other problems and causing damage. So that's a whole other topic, but a, a really interesting one. And ultimately, I suppose, what we need to be thinking about is, is, is this. And again, this is a quote from an AI person. So this is not just externals opposed to AI. This is Jeff Hinton who, 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 did a, who, who uh, resigned in a very high profile manner from Google this year, uh, saying that he was too worried about the direction in which these forms of AI, neural network technology was developing. This quote is from, again, three years ago, an interview that he conducted with Times Higher Education, where as he said, you know, it's great that we can develop the tools and the technology, the goodies, as he calls them, but how we use them depends on us, right? These are social decisions. So we need areas like the humanities, the social sciences. We need people across the board to be involved in, in these discussions. These are the agents I just uh, I just uh, mentioned. I thought they were before this slide. Sorry, I'm a bit out of order. But this is just an example of how these AI agents can fulfill a task. They choose what they're going to do and they execute the task. And you can see it going through executing task by task. This, uh, this AI agent startup in view made the news about two weeks ago for getting some pretty remarkable funding. So again, keep your eyes peeled. This one is coming soon. And I think this one, this one is really going to force us to rethink how we, how we assign work, how we think about assignments, how we judge getting something done, both for ourselves and our students. Because if we very soon are gonna have a technology that will complete tasks for us and solve the problems for us, then what does that mean about us assigning the tasks that add up to solving the problem, right? Some pretty tricky, difficult, really existential, I think, for ed educators, questions coming our way. We've seen some backlash to all of this. This is just to show you that it's there, not to go into it in any, any detail, but again, anyone watching the news will know that Zoom got some pretty big backlash about a month or two ago, as did Prosecraft. There's a lot of backlash happening. There's public conversation. There is creative production that is reflecting all of our fears about living in assimilation. There is reaction to things like AI generated music. Again, I talked about Grimes earlier, but Ghostwriter is another one. The update on this is that YouTube has found a way to monetize this, unsurprisingly. And now instead of Universal Music Group, you know, objecting and taking down songs made by Ghostwriter, they're now finding a way to make money from it. So again, technology, the various industries are actually 
in a way you might say bowing to what's happening. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but that seems to be the reality. They are integrating these tools and they are adjusting their ways of working, their policies to, to reflect that. So what lies ahead? Well, as Yuval Noah Harari said again, uh, a few months ago, he's been doing a lot of talks. He had an interview in The Economist a while ago as well. And as he says, you know, we are dealing with some very, very difficult topics here. You know, we are facing this the potential reality. We are trapped behind this curtain of illusions, which I would say is code for that synthetic media, those images, those videos, those voices, those people. We don't even know what's real and what's not. Those girls in Spain, you know, their parents couldn't tell whether it was them or not. That's how realistic those images were. The mother couldn't tell if it was her own daughter. So we need to make sure that the tools that we have are used for good and not for those kinds of ends. Now, of course, we can only we can only control so much as educators, but we need to be aware. And the reason I bring this up is because as I say here, and I know I'm running out of time, Donna, you can interrupt me if you need to update me, but I have about probably three more minutes if I can take that. Um, I say mind the gap because we need to be aware there's a massive gap right now between higher ed and industry. And some people are attempting to bridge it. I'm one of them, but there's not enough of it, I think. There's not enough awareness in higher ed of what's happening on the cutting edge of AI and where it's coming, how it's coming towards us. So just to be aware, there are some people talking very critically. I would urge you to read the work of all of these people, fantastic books, because what's happening on the right, that Times 100 Most Influential People in AI, which was uh, published two weeks ago, there are three professors on that list of 100, and there is one woman of that three, and that's Emily Bender, the person I mentioned earlier. So we need educators to be involved, and we need them to be talking to EdTech uh, to tell, tell them really what we want. Last but not least for us, before we go to the workshop side of things is guidance from, UN, from UNESCO was just issued two weeks ago as well. Not even two weeks ago, September 5th or so, time is flying. You know, that's three weeks ago now, my goodness. Where essentially they are, you know, I think recognizing the reality that Gen AI is here. So they have issued this guidance on the use of generative AI in both teaching and research. And they're saying it is going to redefine our horizons, but that really what we need to be doing is using it, you know, to make sure that we have human centered digital learning futures, human centered, student centered, etc. They mentioned some policy. I won't go into this in detail. That's just a very brief rundown of what's in that doc. This is what I want to show you. Is the most important recommendation to my mind is this, is that we need to now adopt co-design as a, as a strategy. So what we should be doing now is thinking about how and where and why and when we integrate generative AI into our teaching and learning. Because first of all, in terms of future skills and employability, we know we need to do it. We know our students need to be ready for work. We are aware of that. But we need to be doing it in a, in a, in a careful, um, uh, intentional, purposeful way. And we need to pilot and we need to evaluate. They include some examples. And they talk about how this will also change assessment really, really critically. That we need to be thinking about what we can assess that Gen AI cannot do. Now, I have to say, I worry a little bit about that last statement myself. I felt like UNESCO might even be a little out of date with this recommendation because the truth is, I don't know that those competencies are unique to humans anymore, if you look at the debate going on. But again, it's, it's food for thought because this is where we are. Education 4.0, these are the things we need to be creating. These are the ways we need to be assessing. These are some of the, you know, the tools that we need, to be, we need to be looking at and really using that ecosystem of tools. So I'm going to stop and pause there for now and let maybe Donna tell me what I should do in terms of timing, because I know we have a workshop uh, so I have about 10 minutes or five, five, five minutes or so, maybe 10 max to introduce the workshop part of this, where I'll show you how we can go from digital to AI pedagogy. But for those of you who have to leave, I don't want you to, um, to, to bore you. For those who are staying on online, please feel free to stay. That's fine. But Donna, I'll let you, you tell me, you can direct me, please. I know that you've prepared um, an assignment for us to, to be busy with in the room uh, after we've had a break. So I think we can talk about that now. So we'll uh, we'll stay with Mairead just for a little bit longer so that she can explain what we're going to do after the break and then we'll take a break. And I think this comes in response to the fact that um, with with AI in the in the in the last months, there's been a lot of 
concern, I guess, coming from our teaching staff about, right, how do I rewrite my assessment in light of AI tools like ChatGPT? But I think something that you've really pointed out is actually students need to, when you talk about AI literacy, students need to be able to learn what they should be using AI tools for. What, what's it good at? What can it help with? What's it not good at? And actually, whose responsibility is that within the institution to teach that? Because we have these very short blocks where we teach for six to eight weeks and then they move on to another course. So you don't necessarily always have the time in your course to teach those kind of skills. So I guess I, this relates to the assignment that you're going to give us is not just how do we change our assessment, but do we need to change our teaching and learning activities and how do we assess those literacy, AI literacy skills? So I'll pass back over to you before we take a break. Okay. Wow. It's such a huge remit, Donna. I don't know if I can, if I can teach you all of that at once or if I could teach myself all at once, but I'll cover, I'll definitely cover what I can. We'll, I we'll you invite you back in person. <laughs> okay, so. great. With pleasure. Um, yeah, I mean, we need to rethink everything and we can't teach everything. So the other thing I just want to mention, aside from talking to colleagues and your administrators and your leadership as students, I'm not seeing enough academic staff talking to their students and inviting conversations with students. I actually believe it has to start with that. And I think in your opening day, in your first class, that's probably should be, that should be your, your opportunity to say, this is the class in which we are going to use generative AI. We're going to decide together how and where and why and if we're going to use it. You don't have to use it, you can opt out. We can have discussions about why you wanna opt out. But I would say no matter what course you're teaching, you should build in a session at the very beginning of your term. I know you're three weeks into your term now, but if it's not too late for your next one, um, I think it's really, really important that you do that. And that's why I say, go and have a look at those EU squad reports where they talk about teaching teaching about AI, with AI, and for AI. And that there's, that's really split into, I think, who would be responsible for what. You can't do those all when you're teaching a course yourself. Teaching about AI for them is, that's computer science, that's AI experts. That'll have to be for someone in, uh, let's say, your area, probably Donna, to organize possibly with uh, you know experts in, in specifically those areas who talk about machine learning and LLMs and how they work, et cetera. That would be a specific area teaching about AI, teaching with AI, that's us, the teachers, you know, teaching for AI. I'm not fully sure on what that third category is supposed to be as distinct from the others, but the EU squad reports are a good place to start. So go and have a, go and have a look at those just to get you thinking as well about, you know, how you might approach it. Um, okay. But I am going to, I am going to go on or we're never going to, we're never going to finish and you need a break. So in short, uh, one of the comments, I believe you started your question there, um, Carolina, by talking about the fact that this was more relevant to maybe online learning. And I think that historically that is true. And I might've misunderstood your, your, your uh, comment. So forgive me if I'm misinterpreting you, but my take is this, that there has historically been a, a real division, of course, and spheres and online and face-to-face. -face. COVID brought them together very forcefully in a way that not a lot of people enjoyed. And I think probably the one win from COVID, if there is one, if you can even call it that, is the fact that we digitally upskilled rapidly at a rate and at a pace and a breadth that we never would have done earlier. But I think one of the things we need to take with us from the COVID era is we need to remember that actually learning design is a collaborative team effort because all good online and blended learning design happens in a team. You don't do it on your own because you can't be an expert in everything. You need to be the disciplinary expert, but you need to work with a learning designer or learn the basics of learning design. And you need input from learning technologists who understand these AI tools. You cannot be responsible for all areas yourself. So again, bookmark that as something that you need to go back and talk to your university leadership about, developing this capacity so that academics are not overworked because you can't do it all yourself. These are some of the areas that digital learning innovation developed over the last 23 years. I've been doing online learning since 1999, but I've also been teaching as a professor since 20, since 2000. I went in and did a PhD after doing my work in online learning because it made me realize I really enjoyed teaching. And then I became a face-to-face -face campus instructor. But I've always gone back and forth between the two. I've always taught in both, and I've also worked in ed tech and the corporate side and in startups. So I like to think I can see all perspectives. And I suppose what I take from this list is that there's been a ton of innovation going on in digital technology and digital learning for 20 years that in face-to-face -face education in universities, we're only, we're only starting to get to grips with now. 
talking about flexible learning and curated pathways and blended. We've been doing that for decades, but people just weren't really paying attention, right? So I think we have that to, to use as a basis, first of all. We also have learning theories for decades that can help us. So again, going back to pre-internet, you know, social learning, talking about things like constructivism, how do you work with tools? How do you design learning? How do you design activities that will enable and invite students to construct their own learning from what you do in the classroom or online. Um, experiential learning. This is one of the areas that is ripe for development now in the Gen AI age, I think, where reflecting on what you've done, observing what you've done, apart from the concrete learning, you know, thinking about experimenting. These are theories and approaches I think we need to be incorporating into our course designs. And listen, this is going to take time. This is not something you can do in a week. You're going to have to rethink it, which means you're going to have to go to your leadership and say, we need a bit of time for development. We need to have a workshop on how to do this. And hopefully this will give you some ideas to get started. Um, connectivism is the one that, of course, links us from Web 2.0 to these 4.0 tools. So again, nearly 20 years ago now, Siemens and then Downs came out with this theory of connectivism, which really just says that the student is a node in this digital network where all knowledge resides and that it is up to them to form these connections and they, they can be active agents in their own learning. So when you think about the AI ecosystem of tools, some of those tools I showed you in the first hour, think about that in terms of this kind of framing of the student as an active agent where they can interact with the tools and they can help you know, help them learn, sure, but also help them learn about learning, you know, by, by bringing in those other theories. One of the two most important, the two most important frameworks I use to design learning are these, and they both come from online and blended learning. So again, these are digital frameworks, but the reason I think they're so important now is because to my mind now, all education is digital. I mean, I don't think we need to be convinced of this. I hope we don't need to be convinced of this, but these frameworks really stand us in good stead then when we're applying what's happened for 20 years in blended and online experiments that if we know things work a certain way really well when we're working with tools and emerging technologies, this framework can help us. So the community of inquiry is one that came out of Canada 20 years ago, 2000 or so, um, from a fully online university where really it was focused on how do you create a learning experience with the educational experience at the center that brings kind of brings the full student presence, their mind, their social self together with the teaching presence into the room. And how do you get them focusing on collaborating, constructing learning together from the thing, the work that you assign? You do problem-based learning. This is ripe for this kind of application and this framework, right? But really thinking and learning collaboratively to construct meaning. I'll come back to that at the very end, but just to put it there first. The other one that I use, again, this is my absolute go-to. If the community of inquiry is the big framework, the big picture, ABC learning design is the nitty gritty. And this is what you're gonna work on now in your groups, I think for the rest of the time after the break. ABC learning design, some of you will be familiar with it, divides learning activity types into six types. I won't go through them there, you can read them yourself and you'll return to that slide later. But essentially five of those six historically were active learning, right? So again, thinking about interacting with tools, technologies, uh, and of course the, the information you give them, to construct their own meaning, to construct their own learning. Of the six, only one was so-called passive. And I don't even want to call it passive because acquisition is not passive. And it's definitely not passive now with ChatGPT. There's a lot of room to interact with what the bot gives you back. Another foundation you probably know, I think Donna mentioned to me, you all have heard about constructive alignment, but this should be your starting point for every course design. You're starting with the outcomes that you have in mind. So again, I would think, urge you to think about how does AI change your learning outcomes? How will you have to update your learning outcomes to incorporate those human and AI competencies? How can you think about them? And one little example I'll give you of a tool, I don't think I had time to even put it in this presentation, but the University of Oregon's um, teaching and learning group have just posted online, I'll share it after if it's not in these slides, uh, an updated Bloom's taxonomy where they have mapped AI onto the Bloom's taxonomy. So you can think about how you would write learning outcomes using active verbs, thinking about active learning that incorporate AI as competencies that you have to teach. 
I hope it's in my slide, but it might not be. <laughs> but if not, I'll share it with you afterwards. I don't want to belabor this too much point because this is me kind of plugging my own view. But I will just tell you, I published a paper on this on Monday. So I'll share it with you if you want to have a look. It's literally five pages. It's super short. But my idea is this, that what we need to be doing is a new approach to learning. And I have kind of in a silly way called it generativism. It's all about what UNESCO is suggesting, which is that we now create design with Gen AI. We collaborate with. So we base our designs and our thinking on that constructivist, collaborative social learning from the community of inquiry. We use activities that are very much based in the ABC learning design framework about active hands-on learning, but also personalized assessment, thinking about AI tutors and bots and all of that. But most importantly, we ground that learning in this idea of learning and assessment as a process over time. I don't believe we can assess learning as output anymore. I truly don't. I think Gen AI has completely thrown that out the window. I have yet to see an assignment that cannot be done by Gen AI. I really think that is a, an issue that we're gonna to have to revisit with university leadership <laughs> and systems. And that won't happen overnight either. But this is really about collaboration in the way that, that, that um, UNESCO suggested. So again, just as, as I've said here, you need to be incorporating AI into all of your intended outcomes. You need to be looking at learning activity types. So these are the six types. And for as examples, here you go. Here's how you might think about creating activities for your course, dividing them into learning activity types, and thinking about how you might use those tools to create each of those, an activity based on one of those activity types. Again, you won't do all at once, just like pick one. And I think Donna asked you to pick one, one activity that you do in your class. And I would say, sit down and think about what you want to create, how you teach in the classroom now, what is it that you're doing in the classroom now, what works, what's great about it, what do the students love, but also what do they struggle with? How might Gen AI be able to help or augment or accelerate or deepen their knowledge, whatever it is that it might offer? Think about, because if you do it this way, you are teaching them AI literacy and how to work with AI at the same time. You're doing both. And frankly, that's the trick that we learned in digital education as well over decades, is that you don't need to teach digital education separately. You just integrate it into how you are teaching and learning, and then they learn it with you as you're doing it, and you can talk about it as you go. So as an example, this is the last slide or two. I'm almost finished now, and you can have a break. Here's how I would think about reframing community of inquiry with AI in mind. So we know we want the student's social presence there. I think in terms of AI, we now think about maybe more collaborating with AI, collaborator AI, an agent, an AI agent, if you will, a person who's there with them using some of those tools who can help them with some of these uh, tasks. Cognitive presence, AI is great for analysis, data analysis, interrogation, the Socratic opponent, all of these ideas about interrogating received knowledge you can really think about applying and using generative AI in this context, but reframing as collaborator, analytical, and facilitator AI. And what that looks like, for example, is this. Your collaborator AI might, be, might take on some of these roles. Your analytical AI might fulfill some of these roles. Your facilitator AI could, could fulfill these roles. So now I know I'm throwing an awful lot at you all at once. So don't worry, you're gonna need time probably to digest all of this, but this is just really a way of thinking about those frameworks that we know work, that are based on those learning theories that we ground our, our teaching and learning in. But then adding this idea of generativism, of collaboration with AI and figuring out how can we reframe these approaches and how can we make the best of Gen AI and how can we use it to our, you know, for good <laughs> in our classrooms and to really blow your mind, let's put those activities on top of it. I hope you can see this, you probably can't. But as an example, you know, social presence, collaborator AI, that's a place where you might wanna focus a learning type on discussion. What kind of a discussion activity might you want? Uh, maybe cognitive um, presence, analytical AI, some kind of investigation activity. Down in the bottom, learning type production. Maybe that's where you'll have a facilitator AI helping with the production of knowledge, but also the production maybe of, 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 of outcomes, of, of, of tools, of 
something that a student will use to show you that they've learned uh, what you've assigned to them. Now I'm gonna flip through these just to show you that you can look at these online later, but there are lots of examples of best practice using these, exam these ideas of collaborating with AI. And one of them is actually on the OpenAI website. This is again, Ethan Mollick, even OpenAI has started following Ethan Mollick, it's quite funny. And he breaks down a prompt into four specific steps that you would write if you wanna use GPT or similar, you don't wanna use another tool. Role and goal, step-by-step, constraints, pedagogy, and personalization. And it makes for a huge long prompt. But OpenAI's GPT-4 also now offers you the option to have personalization where you can save your prompts. They really understand how human brains work and that we don't want to write this every time. So again, just to, just to know, you can have this in your saved prompts if you use that model. So you can play around with, it, your, with your students. And these are some examples they have on their website of how students are using uh, their tool for teaching and learning as a tutor uh, to create examples for lesson plans. I'm not necessarily condoning or recommending them. I'm just saying they're there uh, on, on their page for teaching with AI. So final slide, this is, this is really back to kind of plugging for the administrators, but I'll just show it to you because I think before you go to your workshop session, this is really important. I think we need to know that we need in institutions to embrace this idea of learning agility. Today's is an example of it. You're doing it, you're learning. Um, but accessibility, uh, as was brought up already, the question about who gets it, what you get, how you use it, hugely important. You need a network, you need a community of practice. You need to embed those digital pedagogies that I've just probably introduced some of you to. And from those pedagogies and those experiments and the literature we have from the last you know, 20 years, and now people are building on it and, and, and thinking about how can we use Gen AI, we are creating best practices that you will be able to follow and you will be able to, 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 to lean on, but they just don't exist quite yet is the truth. So the tools, the ecosystem is there. I would really uh, recommend if you don't already do it, uh, thinking about radically flipping your classroom if you don't already do it, which is really thinking about what are the so-called high value activities that you wanna do in the class with your students. And I don't even like using high value as a term because it implies others are low value, but I mean the, va the, the activities that you maybe don't trust them to do at home with GNAI, that you wanna know that you're walking them through with them step-by-step step in the classroom if there is any kind of a qualm about trust and who's creating what. Um, so think about the activities, not just what they are, but where you do them and when you do them, what the mode is, what your modality is. And that's me. And then the last one is what I'm going to leave you with here. So this is your assignment. Sorry, Donna, I know we are now at 10.34. The time, I'm sorry, has gotten away from me. Um, but that's the end of it for me. Those are your learning activity types. I think you're going to go into groups. And you're going to choose what you want to work on. And you can use as much or as, li or as little as what I've just shown you of the frameworks. Uh, and just think about how you might want to use, uh, use the tools and think about redesigning learning and assessment with that in mind. That's it for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think I can say on behalf of everyone. On behalf of everyone here uh, uh, in the room and also online, it's been a really helpful uh, presentation this morning. And I'm really glad we called this our CPD kickoff for, for this year, because it's not just a kickoff to our CPD activity for the year, but I also think it's a first step in having these conversations about AI and where to go in the future. And I think it's definitely a conversation that I can see a lot of nods in the room around me that we want to continue with. So we would definitely, I know you were planning on being here today, so we will definitely invite you back to be here in person in the future, I think. But with that, I think we will say thank you very much to you for your time this morning. And for all of the material, we've got a lot of uh, thinking to do in the future. But at the moment, we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back in the room and get on with an assignment. Thank you, everyone online for joining as well. Thanks, everyone.